thank you very much for that very uh, kind introduction. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I want to talk a little bit today mostly about how statistics is used at Google, and not so much because uh, it's special there, but because I think that this is the kind of thing that every company in Silicon Valley is doing these days, and I think by extension every company in the world will be focusing on in the next several years. I wanted to give you a little taste of, of who I am, what I do, and uh, the way we use uh, statistics at Google. So let's start with, with me. Uh, as you heard, I got my undergraduate degree at, uh, at MIT and then my uh, master's in math at Berkeley and PhD at Berkeley in economics. But while I was there, I, wa I, was, I wasn't quite sure that I wanted to do mathematics or uh, statistics, so I took courses from Peter Bickle and from Lehman and a few others in the stat department. I ended up going down the, uh, the math route. I'm not sure I made the, exactly the right choice there because I found in my current job, at least, that statistics has ended up being uh, very, very important. And I worked uh, for Dan McFadden, who's an economist who got the Nobel Prize for his work on using logistic regression as a way to model uh, consumer choice theory. And when I went to, uh, back to MIT as an assistant professor, they asked me to teach the undergraduate stat course that was required for the economics majors at that time. And I have to say, I've often felt that's when I really learned statistics. Because you can go to all of these courses and absorb the mechanics, but when you have to explain it to somebody who's never thought this way before, uh, you get a much deeper uh, understanding, in my view. Now, most of my work has been in economic theory and modeling. And when I went to University of Michigan in the uh, 70s, around 1992, I started uh, doing some work on the internet. Now, at that time, the internet was actually run at the University of Michigan. When I say the internet, I mean the internet backbone that connected together the major US research universities. And uh, I got fascinated by this, maybe obsessed would be the word, and started working on economic issues relating to the internet. Back in 1995, I ended up getting a letter from UC Berkeley that said, we're starting a new school of information and your name has been put forth as dean. Would you be interested in taking on this role? So in 1995, I moved to Berkeley, started a school whose focus was information management, and uh, did that for about uh, seven years. So along the way, I wrote a book with my colleague, uh, former student, Carl Shapiro, called Information Rules, which was about the economics of the information age, I guess. And then from 2000 to 2007, I wrote a monthly column for the New York Times, which was related to, uh, to similar topics. Now at Berkeley, if you're a dean and you can stay out of trouble for seven years, uh, you get time off for good behavior. <clears throat> I found out it's not as easy to stay out of trouble as you might think, but uh, at least they were charitable and gave me the year off. So uh, I had uh, known Eric Schmidt, he was a Berkeley uh, alum, and he invited me to come to Google. He said, I've joined this cute little company there are only about 350 people, but we're having great fun. Why don't you come down, spend some time here, and uh, see what we're doing? So I did that in 2002. I had such a great time, I stuck around. Even when I went back to uh, Berkeley, I continued to consult at Google, and then I uh, shifted over full-time in 2007. And 2009 is the, uh, the famous New York Times quote, I'll give you a little background on that. Because I wrote for the New York Times, I knew several of the reporters there, the technology people, and I remember Steve Lohr uh, came by once and said, what's new, what's interesting, what's exciting? And uh, that's when I launched into the uh, discussion about statistics because I had become aware that more and more data was being collected by Google and other organizations and the real scarcity, the difficult thing, was how do you get that data to tell a story? You know, there's a line in econometrics, if you, if you torture the data long enough, it will, it will confess to anything. And uh, it seemed to me that we had better start honing our tools on 
uh, torturing data, mining data, examining data, however you want to put it. Now, uh, when I first came to Google, I asked uh, Eric, what do you want me to work on? And he said, this was in 2002, so he said, why don't you take a look at this ad auction? I think it might make us a little money. And the ironic thing, of course, is as late as 2002, Google started in, in 1998, uh, didn't really get going for a year or so, but, but uh, there were, there were some, a couple hundred people there. Even as late as May of 2002, Google wasn't completely sure of what its business model uh, would be. So I will talk a little bit about how that works because it is quite an interesting exercise in economic modeling and statistical modeling. And while I was uh, doing that, one day somebody came by and said, can you help me forecast our query growth? And I said, well, what do you do now? She said, well, I take this table of numbers in Excel, and I highlight the column, and I click on the button that says forecast. <clears throat> so I said, well, we might be able to improve a little on that method. Uh, it did took me, it, I remember I spent uh, several hours trying to figure out that, uh, wh what Excel meant by exponential growth. Turned out they meant geometric growth, but uh, there were a lot of uh, episodes like that of struggling with Excel. Uh, then uh, after that I started working on some questions involving advertiser churn, sort of survival analysis uh, from a statistical point of view, estimating lifetime value how much it was worth acquiring new advertisers, what contribution they'd bring to the company, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about a few of these things in a, in a minute or two. Now, we put together a group that was me as the uh, nominal statistician. Uh, as I said, I don't really consider myself a professional statistician, but uh, I knew more than uh, some of the other people, so that qualified me. And we got some computer engineers, some data people, and we had a group called AdStats. And what AdStats did is it, it examined the characteristic, the behavior of the ad system, which is where all the revenue came from. And pretty soon, other people started coming over to AdStats and saying, gee, would you take a look at this problem for me? Or how do we go about solving this? Or how would you uh, deal with uh, this set of data? And so as the company grew, the line outside of our doors got longer and longer, and finally uh, people started saying, heck with it, I'm gonna hire my own analyst. I don't need to go with these AdStats guys. And so we started hiring analysts. So an analyst would be, at Google, a statistician, maybe a mathematician, operations research, uh, finance, uh, so, some area that involved quantitative analysis, and pretty much every product team at Google has one or more analysts, and their role is to work with the engineers and work with the management in trying to understand how their system and their environment is performing uh, within Google. So, so we have a very big team that works on search. Uh, we have a very big team that works on the ad system. But as I show you, we have several other teams that are, that are smaller. Now the trouble with this model is it's very easy to reinvent the wheel and one team doesn't know what the other team's doing and there might just be one person on a team so they don't have any resources to draw on. So when I came to Google, I put together a kind of umbrella uh, organization for the analysts at Google to interact. So we have a monthly newsletter that goes out with little descriptions of what kind of analysis you or your team did this uh, month, and then we have a twice a year get together where people come and listen to some outside speakers and uh, have their own presentations uh, and just interact uh, so as to exchange information. And I think that's been a big help because when you have a lot of people uh, working on different slices of the company, there's always a challenge to keep their work uh, coordinated. So. We have a statistics mailing list. Uh, that's an email list inside the company. It's for people who have questions about statistics and who have answers about statistics. And there are about 650 people who are subscribed to that uh, mailing list. 
And then when we have this uh, biannual meeting, as referring to, we have a mail list of about 350 people that get invited, and then we get roughly 100 to 150 uh, attending. Uh, so it's a you know, fairly, you know, pretty, pretty large group of people, I would say, who are working in, uh, in this area at uh, Google. So, question I get all the time is, what does a chief economist do at Google? And my little response is, I try to answer the questions that management is going to ask next month. So I think several of you could uh, take that same job description, I think, because it's not always just doing the analysis that's important, but figuring out what analysis needs to be done and what kind of issues are going to be arriving in the future. So in my team, I have people that work on revenue analysis, where they're doing forecasting, uh, trying to help with planning or scenario analysis, looking at trends for different verticals, that is different uh, areas uh, which advertisers advertise in, uh, countries, products, and so on. We do what economists would call program evaluation. So we might have a new product or a new service that's become available to our users or to our advertisers or to our publishers. And then uh, somebody needs to look at the adoption rates, the attrition rates, the impact, the performance, effectiveness. So there's a lot of analysis of before and after uh, sorts of data to try to understand how those systems work. Obviously, we do predictive modeling for advertisers. We have systems that look at new advertisers, look at their behavior, try to predict uh, which ones are going to be, uh, become successful and try to nurture along those we think have a high probability of success. And the same thing with users. We try to determine which uh, uh, users, uh, how to help users and how to uh, uh, provide services that we think will be valuable to them. We run a lot of experiments. Uh, we have systems, automated systems that are set up to run uh, A-B experiments, uh, treatment control experiments. Last year we ran about 5,000 experiments on the search side and about 5,000 on the ad side. So whenever you go to Google, you're probably in 15 experiments, something on that order, maybe 10, maybe 20. But uh, of course, you could be the control in some of them, so uh, we, uh, we're doing a lot of that. Auction design, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, policy, well, we have intellectual property, we have privacy, we have antitrust, we have telecom, so there are lots of areas there where they need uh, some economic input. Uh, you heard that I was a microeconomist. I've been uh, drafted to do a little bit of macroeconomics because there's obviously so many events going on in the world these days that are of macroeconomic significance that people like to have uh, somebody who can interpret the tea leaves for them or at least explain uh, some of the issues that uh, we're facing as a company, as a society. We also do a lot of work on the computational infrastructure. One of my uh, colleagues is a, describes himself as a computational statistician. So we're building uh, tools that others can use at Google. Uh, measure, we, we have a big group on quantitative marketing where we're looking at various measures of ad effectiveness, uh, one form or another. And then there's a lot of kind of random uh, internal consulting. And I suppose if uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, and Intel uh, now all have chief economists. So it's gotten to be uh, the thing to do around Silicon Valley. And what do the statisticians do elsewhere in the company? Well, we've got uh, people who are looking at hardware, this is sort of engineering uh, statistics, quantitative marketing, I mentioned, video and TV insights. We're doing a lot of work with YouTube, uh, trying to understand you know, when an when a ad campaign, or not an ad campaign, but when a YouTube video goes viral, that is, uh, experiences very rapid growth, uh, we try to cache it. We have about 11,000 caches around the world, so we're trying to make sure that people can watch those water skiing squirrels or skateboarding dogs or whatever it is that's captivated the public uh, imagination. We have a group uh, doing ads quality, that's quite a large group, on the content side and the search side. 
We have a group doing conversions and attribution. So con these, these are all names of groups at Google. Uh, conversion is marketing language for somebody actually buys something. So a conversion is when, when somebody converts to being a browser to a purchaser. And uh, attribution means you try to discover the causal factors that influence that purchase. Now, as you, you of all audiences will know, understanding uh, the causality for something like that is going to be very, very tricky, but we make some attempts at least to gather metrics that would be helpful in, uh, in doing that. Uh, quantitative user experience, that basically is psychometrics, doing eye tracking studies and looking at different user interfaces and layouts, understanding computer consumer behavior from a kind of laboratory environment. Um, travel analytics, that's about uh, our travel verticals. Sales finance, looking at financial modeling of one sort or another. Affiliate ops, so we have lots of uh, other uh, websites and publishers who use Google service. People analytics, that's the HR group, the human resources group. And they have a group of statisticians there and some labor economists who study our internal uh, behavior of our uh, internal employees and try to understand better what will improve the situation there. Engineering statistics, I've mentioned. Machine learning, which is a giant group in itself. Uh, search and search quality, which is looking at ways to measure how well we're performing in uh, the information retrieval uh, work. We have projects like forecasting and planning, project evaluation, testing new features, modeling behavior of advertisers, publishers, and users, auction design, tool building, surveys, a pretty big uh, set of uh, surveys that go on with advertisers, publishers, sometimes users. And I thought what I'd do is spend the next uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes just giving you some examples of some of the projects. So I wanted to not go into detail, I don't think, but there might be one or two formulas, but uh, basically I want to describe the, the kinds of things that we, that we do, particularly in my group. So, uh, so in many of these other groups, they uh, are doing different things, but I wanted to talk about some things that I thought were particularly interesting. So we'll start with something that economists are interested in, how does Google make money? And the way we make money is we sell advertising and we use a particularly interesting model for selling advertising. Of course, if you look at that picture of a Google search results page, you'll see some ads up here at the top, and you'll see some ads here at the right-hand side, and it's not hard to believe that these ads kind of get the most attention, and then these ads get, uh, get a lesser amount of attention, but the attention uh, goes down as you move down the page. Typically those top ads, uh, people see them a lot. The right-hand side ads they see, but when you get down here, what they say below the fold, where you have to scroll down to see the ads as don't get as much attention. So some of those positions on the page are much more attractive than others. And how do you determine who gets those very prominent positions? Well, what we do is we run an auction, okay? And people ask me once a week, once a month. No, every time there is a Google query, there's an auction, okay? So we're running billions and billions of auctions a day. Now sometimes you don't see ads on every Google page. You only see them on about a third of them. So some of the times the auction says, no, nobody qualifies. Uh, some of the times there might be one or two ads that appear. And then other times there'll be uh, quite a number. I think we can, the maximum we have now is uh, 11 ads per page. So uh, we're running those billions of auctions and a very simple, simplified version of the ad auction is we order the ads by the bid per click, how much the advertiser is willing to pay if there's a click. That's not quite right, but let's uh, take it as a simplification. Uh, the highest bid gets the best position, second highest, the second best position and so on. Then each ad pays the bid uh, associated with the ad below it. And people say, why do you do that? This is what's called by economists a second price auction or a second bid auction. Why do you do that? Well, imagine yourself as an advertiser. You'd like to pay the least you can to maintain your position. 
So the advertisers would like to cut their bid to try to maintain the position they have and pay the least for it in a first price auction. So we just do that for them. We say, we'll cut your bid and you're guaranteed that you pay the minimum bid necessary to retain the position you have. And that makes the whole uh, auction a lot more stable because you don't see this moving around a lot. So there's a analysis you could go through, you can find papers on this, but in the simplest case, you could think about the advertiser wanting to maximize its profit, so that would be the value of a click or the value of a visitor to your web page times the number of clicks you get minus the cost of those clicks. So in, there's a little formula, ma whoops, maximize, wrong thing here. Maximize, yeah. here we go. Maximize value of clicks times number of clicks minus cost of clicks. And so the advertiser would want to operate at the point where value this marginal cost. The value of an extra click would just be uh, the value of the cost of acquiring that extra click. So the question then is the cost function is more or less observable. The value is not necessarily observable to us, although the advertiser uh, probably has a pretty good idea of how much a visitor is worth to their website. So what we'd like to do is estimate that marginal cost at the current operating position, because that gives us a good idea of how the advertiser values those clicks. So we have a little system called the bid simulator. And what the bid simulator does is it simulates the outcome of the auction if the advertiser changed its bid. And if you go through the details, which I'm not going to do, if you bid more, you can, if you raise your bid, you can see where you're going to land on the page. And we have estimates of how many clicks you're going to get in these different positions. Our basic model is the total clicks is the ad specific effect, has to do with the quality of the ad times the position specific effect, which has to do with the kind of user interface issues I discussed earlier. And if we're moving the same ad to different positions, we're controlling for the ad specific effect. And so all we have to care about is the position effect. So the only real unknown is the click the advertisers would get in these other positions. And if you build this bid simulator, you can actually do a pretty good job of estimating those clicks. And in particular then, you can estimate the marginal cost that the advertiser, or the cost function, and from that get the marginal cost that the advertiser faces when they make their uh, decision. So you can use that to evaluate the impact of system changes on advertisers. So you can see how the value changes. You can compare how value of advertisers changes over time. You may have a very competitive uh, market in some areas, so the advertisers are competing ten intensely. In another country, it may be much less uh, competitive. And you can compare advertiser values in different auction configurations. So you can look at what happens if there are lots of people involved in the auction or if there's just a few people. And to take a very simple example, uh, if you have all ad slots identical, so don't worry about the position effect, and you have all advertisers have the same value, so we don't worry about the heterogeneity among advertisers, and there's some minimum reserve price. So reserve price is uh, auction terminology, it means the minimum price you have to pay if you want to purchase the good in question, which is this case, uh, an ad uh, click. So if there's three slots and three bidders, it's not very competitive. Everybody ends up paying the reserve price because there's no competition there. But as soon as there's three slots and four bidders, then in the equilibrium, everybody pays their value V, their assumed common value. So you get this big discontinuity in revenue when the auction fills up. And you observe that all the time in auctions. Some of you might look at the spectrum auctions that have uh, been happened around uh, Europe and other places where they're auctioning off spectrum for mobile phone purposes. If you have more bidders than slots, they make a lot of money. If you have fewer bidders than slots, then they uh, make almost nothing. Good old principle of demand and supply, and it shows up in a very strong form in uh, this uh, auction. Now, more complex and more realistic model of the auction is we don't actually do a straight 
pay-per-click model. It's much more like a pay-for-impression model. So again, impression is advertiser speak for seeing the ad. So an ad impression. When you see an ad on TV or in a magazine or in a billboard or on a website, that's an impression. So we have space to put ads, just like a TV a station might have space to put ads, or a magazine ha might, ha might have space to put ads. So we want to sell impressions, but the advertiser doesn't really care directly about impressions, they care about visitors to their website, and eventually conversions or purchases. So you need a way to convert those ad impressions into those ad clicks, kind of exchange rate. It's like I want to pay in dollars and you want to get paid in pounds, well we have to have an exchange rate to convert those dollars to pounds, and here the exchange rate is the click-through rate, how many clicks you can expect to get uh, per impression. So it's quite important in running this auction to understand how many clicks an advertiser can expect, conditional on the ad impression, and it's very natural from a statistical point of view to think of that as a logistic regression. Probability of a click given the impression is a function of some uh, explanatory variables. Now, the best variable is going to be the historical data, how many clicks per impression this ad has gotten historically. But for a lot of ads, you don't have very much historical data. And then you might think of other ads that this, this advertiser has put up, what the vertical is, what the country is, what the competitors of the auction is, and all sorts of other potential predictors for this click-through rate. So we run a logistic regression updated in real time, and I said it's the world's largest logistic regression. I believe it's the largest because we have about a trillion uh, observations for that regression. Uh, and we have, well, depending on how you count, uh, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of potential predictors. So it's a pretty big uh, computational task. Obviously, we aren't inverting matrices. We're using some machine learning methods to do it, but it's quite a uh, interesting system from the viewpoint of uh, machine learning and computation. Another project that we worked on in my team is called Website Optimizer. Uh, that was a system that allowed publishers to optimize the user interface of their web page. So in the original model, you could take a proposed design and another proposed design, and then you could just alternate, randomly show one of these web pages to potential users. And after a while, uh, you could determine whether one web page was better than another web page at maximizing some particular uh, goal, which might be conversions or purchases on your website. Now, this turns out to be expensive not because there's any cost to running the experiment, but because there's a cost to doing something that isn't optimal, right? You could, if you're comparing A and B, uh, and you find out after a few hundred trials that B isn't doing so well, in the old system, it just kept doing it anyway. So clearly, to make this attractive to the publisher, you'd want to use a sequential testing method. method. And the other thing is, doing a simple A-B testing, you couldn't really model features. So you might say that, well, I know the overall design of the web page. I just don't know which colors or fonts or images are the best. And images are quite important because uh, maybe one shot, one picture of your product or, or whatever it is that you're concerned about, one picture may elicit quite different consumer behavior than another. Picture. So you'd like to be able to look at not just the two static web pages, but how features might uh, drive the behavior you're interested in. So we developed a system for looking at this as a multi-arm bandit approach, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, where you've got an objective of trying to maximize uh, whatever your uh, desired goal is, let's say conversions, and you've got this uh, classic exploration, exploitation uh, trade-off. So we did this in a, a fairly sophisticated way uh, using some reasonably nice uh, theory and uh, cost-effectiveness, uh, theory and uh, uh, computer implementation. It turns out this gives you a dramatic improvement 
in cost effectiveness for your testing. Because if you're testing, let's say, five different designs and you find out after a few hundred iterations that two of them are not very good, then you get rid of those quickly. You focus in on the ones that look like they're really performing. And of course, you don't care too much uh, about the experiment if the remaining choices are very similar in performance. You've lost very little. So the big advantage is get rid of losers quickly, and you can also model features in this environment uh, quite easily using a Logit or a Probit uh, kind of formulation. Publisher quality. This is kind of an interesting uh, story. We have a quality score for each publisher I'm not going to go into where that, uh, where that comes from. It's based on observed performance. So after we've observed the publisher for uh, a few weeks, we have a fairly good idea of what this score is. Uh, but there are lots of new publishers keep popping up. So what do we do for these people we don't have enough information? Uh, what we came up with was a, really a textbook example of an empirical Bayes model you could think about the publisher as a coin with probability P of coming up heads, where P is the measure of quality. It happens to be between zero and one, so it's a natural uh, model. And maybe we're looking at two different countries. We have a known distribution of these P's, that is, these publisher scores within country A and country B. And we can think about those distributions as a prior uh, over what would happen if we got a new publisher, where it's like we're reaching in the distribution, pulling out a publisher, and then we start flipping the coin. So the initial draw is drawing from this empirical distribution of uh, known publisher scores, and then as we flip the coin, we update our posterior to reflect the uh, empirical evidence we have on the actual behavior of that publisher and we do just classic Bayesian uh, updating here. My little uh, picture of the coins has overlapped the Bayesian update statement. And uh, this way, you get a very natural way to start out with a reasonable default and then update as new information becomes available. And of course, you can add other uh, predictors. That would be anything that you observe at the time the publisher is created things like which country it is in, what the language of the web page is, what the vertical is, that is a publisher classification, and so on and so on and so on. So we do a kind of nice, I think, simple and, and, and classic textbook example of, uh, of uh, Bayesian empirical Bayes uh, updating. Now there are some problems because you do have a survivorship bias issue. I told you publishers are coming in all the time, but then publishers are leaving all the time as well. And so when you look at a country, the distribution of the survivors could be somewhat different than the distribution of entrants. Uh, we have some corrections for that uh, as well. And also, you could have a, a, a potentially asymmetric loss function. It may turn out that classifying a, a good publisher as bad is worse than classifying a bad publisher as good. So you can make some adjustments to take account of that uh, asymmetry but it ends up being a pretty, uh, pretty attractive system for uh, solving this particular problem. A couple years ago, uh, I, uh, management said, how would the recession affect our revenue? And I said, guys, give me a break. We've only got one observation because we only had one recession. See, this is an economist think that if we only had a lot more recessions, we'd know a lot more. <laughs> And I think that is true, but it's not really an experiment we want to run. But then I realized we actually had 50 observations because we could look at Google revenue by state. Our systems understood the geography of where these ad clicks came from. And uh, we could also look at economic indicators that were collected by state, like personal income or unemployment rate. So you could estimate a longitudinal model where each state had some revenue and each state had some indicator of its economic performance that reflected the uh, recession uh, economy and determine the response of revenue uh, by state to this economic metric by state. So instead of just having one time series observation, we actually had 
50 observations on the, uh, on the states, and luckily, I guess, uh, each state kind of went into the recession at a different time. As Michigan and the auto industry went in rather early, Texas, which was benefiting from high oil prices, ran in rather late. California and New York really didn't go into a recession until the uh, uh, financial uh, big drop in uh, uh, Lehman Brothers default and this uh, financial uncertainty that surrounded that. So you could look at how revenue changed as each of these states went into a recessionary environment <coughs> and get kind of a, a GDP beta. You could see how Google revenue responded to uh, the economic indicators on a state-by-state -state basis, which turned out to work out quite well. And we could use that then to do some scenario planning when we were looking down the road to see what recovery would look like. Incrementality of ad clicks. This is kind of a nice one. Uh, when you do a web search, you have organic results, that is the search results, and then sometimes you have the ads. And one question would be, how many incremental clicks does that ad generate? Because we have a very well-known brand like Amazon, then lots of people would just click on the search result and go directly to Amazon. So the ad in that case might generate relatively few incremental clicks over what you would have without the ad. So we want to investigate this uh, incrementality of the ad clicks that's inherently a counterfactual question, because you say, if this ad wasn't there, uh, what would we see? And uh, the way we uh, did that is we uh, exploited uh, natural changes in ad spending. So for example, at the end of the quarter, lots of times uh, companies will change their spending behavior, either because they have leftover budget or because they've run out of budget. So you can see this more or less or let's say it's reasonable to assume that you're seeing an exogenous variation when you have a big drop in spending or a big increase in spending. And then we try to estimate how many clicks would have occurred in the absence of that change. And we compare that uh, counterfactual uh, to the actual clicks. So you've got a model of how the clicks are generated. You estimate the model, look at the counterfactual, and then try to measure the incrementality of the clicks. And we set this up so it examined all the spending pattern for all the advertisers, could search for cases where we saw these large uh, changes in the spending pattern, and then measure the incrementality according to this model. So there was a whole engineering side of this that was implementing the statistical model in a way to uh, understand the question we were, we were looking at. And a kind of closely related question is the incrementality of mobile queries. So everyone uh, is familiar that mobile activity is growing. Smartphones are becoming a bigger and bigger part of the market. Lots of people are using Google on their smartphone. But from the company's point of view, you want to know, are these really incremental queries? What would have happened if they didn't have the smartphone? Maybe those queries would have occurred on their desktop or laptop computer. So you can ask about how many extra queries you're getting from those mobile devices. Obviously, it's not going to make sense to look at averages for people who have mobile devices and people don't because there's a huge selection problem there. So what we do is what economists call a difference in differences analysis. We look at the change in behavior uh, in those who acquire a mobile phone. So you observe somebody going along doing this many queries per week, they acquire a mobile phone, maybe the mobile queries obviously jump, they didn't have one before, but you want to know do total queries jump or not, or are they just replacing queries that would have occurred anyway on the, uh, on the other device. So this could be modeled by looking at user-specific fixed effects, seasonal fixed effects, a zero-one treatment, and then uh, you write down a little model that says the queries you observe at time t depend on the user effect, the seasonal effect, plus this treatment effect. Now, of course, this is not true causality uh, because of the selection issue, but it is arguably a measure of the impact on the treatment for those who choose to be treated. And in many cases, this is a voluntary decision. You're not going to impose a uh, cell phone on anyone 
this is the kind of thing that you want to uh, have, impact of treatment untreated, and we can get reasonable measures of what the incrementality of the uh, mobile queries look like. So it's quite a handy thing to be able to do. Um, again, there are second order effects or refinements. People who choose a new device earlier than others are presumably different in some way. So you might look at the uh, impact from the enthusiastic initial users as being potentially different than what would happen later on, but that can also be modeled. Give you a very quick review of something we're doing uh, uh, using Insights for Search. This is a little system that's available to everyone where we can um, show you an index of what search activity looks like on any given term. In this particular case, I typed in the term hangover and we see it peaks every Sunday, whoops, peaks every Sunday, and then that is New Year's Day, okay? <laughs> nice little outlier. And in fact, you can compare the patterns of queries. This one, I typed in hangover and vodka, and you can see queries on vodka peak every Saturday, and that's December 31st. So it's kind of a nice uh, model of what uh, some people call Granger causality, asking whether one time series is predictive uh, for another. Good example to, to show your students. But you can use this for serious things. This is an example where of something called Google Correlate, where I took initial claims for unemployment benefit, and that's where people file to receive unemployment benefits, and said, what is the query that is the most highly correlated with that series. So this is just looking at simple correlation. Turns out that query is file for unemployment. And it's not too surprising because if you became unemployed, you first thing you might do is go to Google and say, how do I file for unemployment? <clears throat> Where's the unemployment office? How do I collect unemployment benefits? And so on and so on and so on. I'm sure it would be slightly different language here in Britain, but uh, you get the idea. And you can see those two series are very, very highly correlated, which suggests that file for unemployment, that query activity is a contemporaneous indicator of what the actual uh, initial claims for unemployment look like. So we can build a model that will allow us to predict the um, these time series, the economic index that we're interested in, unemployment or inflation or automotive sales or retail sales or any of those things, using as inputs to that predictor uh, the uh, Google query data. Now I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to be able to go over this uh, particular example, but uh, what we do is we basically combine a Kalman filter with a Bayesian variable selection mechanism and uh, a little bit of uh, of uh, model averaging to get our final prediction, and we have a system that allows you to almost automate this, uh, this activity of finding predictors in the data for uh, these kinds of uh, economic series. So I'm quite excited by that work as an economist. All right, we'll skip that, and we'll skip that, and that, okay. Last topic. This is something we just come up with, which, which I think is very, very neat. It's uh, something called consumer, Google Consumer Surveys. And the way it happens is imagine yourself looking up something on the web, and you come to a newspaper article, and it shows you a few lines of the story, but then it says, sorry, you aren't a subscriber. I can't let you in. Well, now that publisher has a choice. He can say, you aren't a subscriber, but if you answer this little survey question, I'll let you in. And so up pops this survey uh, that asks anything. It can ask if the election were tomorrow, who would you vote for? It asks, have you heard of this brand name? Or are you thinking about buying a car in the next six months? Whatever question you want to ask, and you, anybody, can use this system simply by going to Google Consumer Surveys, creating the question you want to ask, and then it's distributed out to the publishers and this kind of uh, uh, survey taking activity occurs. Now, if any of you have taken surveys on the web, you know the response rates end up being a few percent. We're here, we're getting 35, 40% response rates. So it's far, far larger than you get from those kinds of uh, 
surveys, and that's because the user is actually getting rewarded. They're able to get to the content they want to get to. So this is a little example of what the output page looks like, where you can see this question is, would you say that you and your family are better off or worse off financially than you were a year ago? And this is looking at the responses these individuals made. Over here, you can break them down by inferred demographics. This is our estimate of demographics based on web browsing behavior and some of the uh, 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 cookie information and some of the census information in the US. So we have a way to estimate not only the response, but also what the demographics of the survey uh, recipient is. OK, last two slides. Experimentation, I alluded to this earlier. We have fabric systems to do all sorts of experimentation on the web page, search results, and on the ads. We could do query experiments, where you're treating different queries differently. Cookie experiments, where you're treating different individuals differently on a persistent basis. Geographic experiments, where you're targeting certain regions or metros. And, of course, temporal experiments, where you turn something on for a while and turn it off. So there are lots of different ways to do this kind of experimentation. And it's absolutely critical, obviously, to understand anything that's uh, really a uh, causal uh, relationship. Lots of other stuff. What are we looking for um, in new hires? We want people who have a broad knowledge of statistics. And I think it's a little different than academia. As an academic, I can say that there's a lot of rewards to specialization, uh, but Many times in industry and at Google, we're looking for people who have a broad education and are familiar with many different uh, areas, as well as having some uh, depth. We want computer coding skills like Python, data and database manipulation skills, SQL and so on, machine learning, uh, visualization, and very importantly, communication skills, because you have to explain what you're doing to people who are going to implement or use the discoveries that you've uh, made. Uh, understand the question, ask, understand the domain, ask the right questions, use the right tools, and do it fairly quickly. Because when you're working in a very competitive industry, you have to think about getting your job done in a matter of weeks, uh, not really a matter of, uh, of months. I'm going to skip that and end with this slide. It's not just. Google, everybody is collecting huge amounts of information. If you look at uh, Intuit, uh, Visa, MasterCard, Walmart, Safeway, all of these guys have data warehouses. All of them are getting very valuable information from this measurement that they're now able to do. And the real gap is in finding people who can make that information tell its story. So. I'm going to now insert my little ad. Google's hiring statisticians in the UK. <laughs> I don't think this will be viewed as particularly annoying. Uh, and this is a one page on statistician engineering analysts. And here's another one on quantitative marketing manager in uh, London. So we're definitely looking for people who are interested in working on this set of issues. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat>